whose topic is who was Lee Harvey Oswald. And he came all the way here from Belarus. We had a, a little bit of a flap about his visa, and we wrote to them, but eventually he got his visa. And he was Oswald's best friend when he lived in the Soviet Union. And uh, he is a well-credentialed uh, medical exam or, uh, investigator uh, and assistant at the Department of Physiology at Minsk uh, State Medical Institute. Uh, and uh, he holds many degrees and has written many papers. And uh, he's a, uh, a neuros neurosurgeon uh, ex and examines those parts. So he has a long uh, series of medical degrees and dissertations uh, on that topic. But he's written a little book that I think you can get here today called Oswald's Russian Episode. And he wants to talk to you about that and actually let you hear the voice of Lee Harvey Oswald which we rarely do except in those press releases when he's a little stressed, and hear what he was like in person uh, when he was in the Soviet Union. So I wanted to invite Dr. Titovitz up to the stage. And just thank him for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, honor for me to be here and to deliver this report and to be heard. Uh, well, I thank John for just uh, helping me with obtaining my visa. There was a slight hitch, uh, but still in demanding some, demanding some attention. Uh, actually, instead of 10 days, uh, it lasted four times a day, so there is some point for uh, worrying, and I thank John and those who supported, uh, stood behind me for help. Well, eventually I'm here. Well, you know, in all uh, investigations, it's important to know what kind of character uh, the accused person was. Uh, much follows from that. Whether was capable of committing this or that act, felony, and I think I can enlighten you on this point. Well, actually, he was my, and I was his English-speaking friend in Belarus. We met first in autumn 1960, and I saw him off on uh, 23rd of May 1962, and then our uh, friendship lasted, uh, well, to the very end. My last letter, I'll show you here, uh, was I sent to him in October 1963. Well, you know, before, I just had a brief exchange with people here. Well, I'm sort of curiosity. I'm a new face here, coming from that well, say, unknown communist country. There are many courses for approaching me, a probe into my mentality in a way. And what I learned, people ask me questions, and they were surprised on both parts. First, I was surprised, why, you don't know that? That's obvious. And people were surprised at the answers they got, you know. So what is obvious to me, I take for granted, is not obvious to many people here. I don't know why this very important issue of Oswald uh, inner working of Oswald uh, inner mind was somehow neglected. A comparison to all other things, say all those theories, all that uh, details, some of them minutely developed. Uh, so I share with you my experience. Again, in return, I'm going over these days to hear your experience. I, I suppose together we'll build this mosaic of facts uh, in a new way, and possibly we'll arrive to a more definite, definite understanding of what happened at that time in Dallas and whether and why all that was so complicated, and still we have this question. On this slide, first, uh, indeed, who was Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, well, that's the question. And uh, I'm just sitting there pondering over. 
Well, I know this, Harvey Oswald. Possibly this face, this smile is not familiar to many Americans. That that's what the man I uh, the man I knew. And unfortunately, we can't read. What's the, uh, don't be in a hurry. Just wait for my signal, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, what I, I quote the, here uh, from my book that Oswald was a, uh, well, just uh, cuts, uh, well, cited is exactly. Oswald was uh, a very uh, rep, uh, featured from many sides, uh, for many sides, and it looks like he was an actor who could so perfectly play his roles, polar roles that many a clever and uh, bright investigators, depending on what side that would take, is, it, believe that they was the only true Oswald. Well, that's the essence of that quote. Where we are. Do we have a pointer here? No. Laser pointer, please. Uh, here, again, Oswald, in company of his fellow, fellow workers. Uh, well, in, in the center, it's Lee Harvey Oswald. Look at those smiling faces. They're happy. There's nothing rehearsed about all that. That's just a snatch, well, a photo from their everyday life well done by an amateur photographer. And now look at the next one. Please, next up. Well, wake up, please. It's, it's me who is sleeping. <laughs> next slide, please. Well, yeah, look at this one. This is favorite uh, 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 photograph that was much featured to present Oswald in a sort of mafiosi. And indeed, it's the same uh, slide. They're just guys are playing with dark glasses. The idea is to, uh, well, to represent a foreigner to the best of their ability. So the guys are putting on glasses and having a laugh. You see, they're trying to contain their laughter. Uh, what about this picture? You'll find this in a lot of well, American presentation, uh, just a CD, DVD comes to mind with cutting from this, this part, uh, colored in mauve and something, just to, well, uh, sickle and uh, hammer somewhere on the side, uh, well, to give an idea that Oswald was this uh, well, menacing figure. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I just briefly come over what people surrounded Lee there. Uh, this is Lee at his flat. Uh, some investigators uh, write that he lived in a lavishly furnished flat. Look, really furnished, a deal table, plain clothes and everything. No, it was a very poorly furnished flat. And this is an interpreter. Uh, from a tourist, well, read a KGB one. Well, that's the pretty lady over there. And here I quote uh, from uh, Lee's, Lee's diary that they would spend a lot of time together, went to movies, and sort of so, uh, so, uh, so forth and so forth. Uh, next, please. Slide, please. Uh -huh. uh, that's Lee's first love. Uh, well, a young man coming to a foreign country, still full of, well, say, new impressions, uh, unmarried, uh, springtime, he met this girl and fell in love. It's Ella German, a Jew, and here they are celebrating his birthday and at his flat. Uh, well, interpreter, Rosa, Ella Her 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 German, Lee, and Pavel Golovachev, who worked with uh, Oswald at the factory, a radio factory, and a KGB informer, uh, self-confessed. He's dead already, uh, natural death. He's a heavy smoker, overweight. 
Well, uh, usually he, he took a lot of pictures of Oswald, and in a way I'm thankful for him for that. I have two pictures, original pictures by him. Next slide, please. And here, Lee, he, he was uh, loved uh, fishing with the family of Ziggers, a Spanish-speaking uh, family. Uh, by the way, I was introduced to Lee at the Ziggers family. And this is Anita Ziggers, you know, the one who gave uh, John Armstrong wrong information about, is it okay now? Uh, about Lee not speaking Russian, uh, Russian in Russia at all. I don't know what came about, but that was false information. Uh, next one, please. Well, that's finally we come to friends of Lee Harvey Oswald. That's handsome me, and that is another handsome me. Uh, I went in for research from the very f first year at the Medical Institute, and that's I am in the process. And here I'm sitting in the background. It's the place where Lee lived, his house. Uh, and uh, here I, I live, uh, give here a quotation. He, uh, Lee mentioned at least four times uh, about his English-speaking friend, that I'm a bright guy, that I'm a medical institute. It's a flattering one. Well, I agree with that. And uh, uh, what else? Uh, at the end of his diary, he writes uh, about his, was about to leave the, United, uh, the Soviet Union for the United States. Uh, he writes, I still didn't tell uh, an Eric you see, in Russia, Eric is friendly to Ernest, not Ernie, but Eric, uh, that we are living for the stage. Uh, I'll wait till the last moment. In literature, it was misinterpreted as a kind of, uh, well, suspicion or something. Indeed, it was absolutely different. You see, I was a young Communist League member, as everybody around, it didn't mean a thing. Uh, and... Uh, being a young Communist League member, I had to persuade Marina not to go to the United States. If I didn't know anything about that, as Lee insisted, well, I was not guilty of neglecting my Komsomol's duty. So I'm thankful for him, for his, uh, well, uh, my creating image of political correctness in this way. Nobody could blame me for not uh, sticking to my consumer duties. Uh, by the way, that's the only, uh, the only uh, not the only uh, favor that he gave to me. I believe actually he saved his and my life, but it's going to be later. Uh, well, next one, please. Now, uh, Oswald in Minsk, well, rubbed shoulders with uh, many people of different social standing. Uh, this, uh, look, well, this is, I believe, uh, many recognize Chairman Khrushchev, and this lady is Professor Cherkasova. Oswald was at her place. And with uh, her son, uh, they got together uh, they, uh, and they discussed things. And she was for a while a sort of confidant to him. She he would tell her about what ha happened at, at the factory and everything. And she went in for classified research. It's surprising that around Oswald, something would be classified, sort of they would bait, uh, see if, uh, well, he would swallow the bait. Uh, one, uh, for one, well, this lady with classified research, who was admitted in the presence, uh, presence of uh, Chairman Khrushchev on their way to uh, United Nations Organization session, uh, then at the factory, ah. Uh, they was uh, they produce some instruments for the military, uh, so some funny things. Uh, well, as if somebody expected his reaction to those things. Next slide, please. 
Now, this is just to give you an idea of the of means. You see, uh, well, it's the opera house when we were with Lee, that's uh, KGB, by the way, built one of the first buildings after the war. Minsk was absolutely destroyed, raised to the ground. That's the place where Lee lived, the house. That's a view from the Gorky Park, just op opposite his place. It's a beautiful place. Opera house, military headquarters, you see, regional military headquarters. He was placed next to, standing uh, on his balcony. He could easily read and see the activity going around there, see the ranks of the officers arriving, the car now, uh, license plates. So you see uh, classified research, uh, military equipment produced at the factory, uh, living cl place close to the military headquarters. Well, just a wide range of activity for a potential spy. Now then, uh, this is, uh, I, well, unfortunately, all that is in my book. Uh, this, I wanted to show how close were all those who were friendly with Lee. Uh, factory around, as if he lives over here, lived over here, somewhere here is the factory, opera house, uh, the Institute of Foreign Languages, where we will come over to the dormitory. Uh, well, we were young and naturally interested in girls, and we, uh, they spoke English, but we were very decent. We were that generation, not uh, modern generation. And uh, sort of, if one, just from point of view of uh, just observing his actions, you see, he, this was open for observation. With a pair of binoc binoculars, you can see what was going on in his flat from many points. If he walked to the radio factory, his route would lie along here. So, well, by the way, for the truth, I lived very far from here. <laughs> well, although, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, well, again, in literature, uh, uh, Epstein, yeah, placed me somewhere here, just to be more convincing. From his point of view, he had his aims in mind. Uh, by the way, he also wrote that uh, a river was navigable. No, there was no navigation there, very shallow but narrow uh, bridges. And he would say, right, that Oswald standing on the balcony, uh, well, observed the magnificent park vista and the ships passing by. Uh, you know, along with lavishly uh, furnished flat, you see, all those uh, discrepancies would travel from one uh, uh, researcher to another and would, on them would build wrong theory. It's just an example how wrong information would eventually result in wrong theories. Uh, now, so uh, you see there wasn't much traffic here, not much people, just, uh, well, uh, rather, uh, well, uh, quiet city, no, no, no Americans at all. By the way, he didn't have telephone in his flat. Surprising, didn't have the television set. Again. Next slide, please. Well, here is another, well, the place where Lee met Marina. Just opposite him uh, was, and still is, uh, opposite the, well, this the party museum. You see, he was a Marxist. And uh, it was natural to, place, uh, to play, uh, let him live close to the part of the museum. Surprising thing, we never discussed this point with him. Uh, to me, it was, uh, well, invisible. It was boring. And he never raised this uh, issue of party museum. It was non-existent for me. Uh, next, pl uh, please. And here is the victory square. You know, I said before that he uh, sort of uh, saved his in my life. I never uh, 
paid any attention to that till an American investigator, investigator after I read my book, said, listen, there's another interpretation to that case. Uh, some, well, already it was dark. We we're going on our way to the dormitory to meet our girls. Uh, and we hardly crossed the Excel line when suddenly, well, Oswald sprang back pushing me along with him, and there was a car, black shape of a car, spitting car, rushing by. I only saw the tail lights over there. That's all. Oswald was shocked. And indeed, you see, we were here, and for a spitting car, it was illogical to approach us. Rather, they'd go straight along here. Well, uh, at that time, I didn't pay much attention to that. He said, oh, he's almost got us. I rather pondered over, well, this use of colloquial God uh, run over. Uh, but Oswald was really shocked with that. Uh, well, that I could be interpreted both ways. And his reaction, and uh, in any way, he might be mutilated, or I don't know. Well, next slide, please. Well, here, just Oswald, Oswald and Navy, me. <laughs> military training. We had a military course at the Medical Institute. It was only a matter of uh, two months staying at uh, Wabrusk military camp and uh, we at the end we were promoted to junior lieutenants and I just uh, introduced this to see, to demonstrate that I was also sort of familiar with the army, although no comparison with also he served almost full term and I only two, well, two months. Next slide, please. Well, here are writings Oswald this is Old Man River. It's, I asked him to give me the words from the showboat uh, musical. Here there is, uh, here is the Eric, I can't make it. Uh, well, uh, next slide, please. Here we, I just, I analyze his English, his phonetic symbols, and this is a pray, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Uh, I just ask him to give me this prayer. Well, next one, please. And here, you know, I studied his American accent. From the very beginning, I saw uh, that he was a southerner. Uh, non erotic English, he would say a sort of nasal uh, twang, he would draw certain, not at all, something like that. Uh, Twenty, he would say axed. At that time, I didn't know that it was just colloquial. He would say wished for wished, uh, well, that sort of thing. And uh, I just recorded uh, his voice. We. Well, the first one was at the recording studio of the Medical Institute. We were given the tape, and I was, uh, well, privileged there. I knew the language. I came over to talk to the teachers. They knew me, and they would just uh, give uh, uh, me the tape recorder, do anything you like, even supplied me the tape. And I may ask Lee to read Shakespeare, uh, then we read Pygmalion, well, in amateurish way. Here, uh, you'll be able, I hope, uh, just wait. Uh, Lee reading Shakespeare, and my story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. She swore in faith, twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me and bade me, if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story, and that would woo her. Upon this hint I speck, she loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did not pity them. 
This only is the witchcraft I have used. Here comes the lady. Let her witness it. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, you must have observed that, that he tries to impersonate uh, Othello, this powerful man. Uh, then he was unfamiliar with Shakespeare. He said, she, he, she loved me for the danger I passed, and I loved her that she, in Shakespeare's did pity them. And she says, she didn't, for, uh, she didn't pity them. You know, it's, uh, well, uh, well, uh, there are more on the tape, and just don't press this one. It needs an explanation. This is a mock interview. It's another recording I made at my place. We're alone, playing with a microphone. You see two, well, young men being sort of carried away. First, he read a lot by um, some, well, uh, The Killers, by Ernest Hemingway. First, he didn't like to read. He wasn't in the mood. I persuaded him. Uh, then, uh, after a while, he warmed up to his task, and we started improvising. First, it was an improvised interview. I made him Professor Pepper and asked him a lot of stupid questions, like, uh, what do you think about uh, growing uh, melons and water on the apple tree, that sort of thing. Well, how to increase uh, harvest, he would say, to bury black cats. Uh, and protect uh, potato from rain. It's sort of rubbish, but it was absolutely hilarious at that time. We believed it was just, uh, uh, well, hilarious. And this one, I suddenly decided to make him a Jack Ma, a killer, uh, who was in a prison at that time. And I was uh, interviewing him from pre prison, yeah, prison yard. Uh, again, this... Uh, interview is favorite for public uh, TV, again for Norman Mailer, but favorite only the first part of it. In the first part, he boasts, well, it's absolutely horrible without context, you see, his absolutely mental case. Both we are mental cases there, but in the context, it was absolutely uh, well, hilarious, we uh, well played and uh, spoke stupid things uh, without realization that it would be used as evidence against us, you know. And they didn't include the second part of this interview, where we, uh, he puts uh, the uh, Jack Ma, the criminal, on an electric chair. Uh, you say somehow it interferes with uh, what uh, were against Oswald, uh, his image. And now we'll uh, listen to this one. Come on, please. Well, ladies and well, gentlemen, now I walked past it here from the I'll courtyard. The well, the man shouting is a famous killer. Uh, well, uh, when he was one year, he killed his grandma. And he, well, he hanged and his mother. And now I give the word to Mr. To Mr. Jack Marr. So here you have his voice. Goddamn, well, give me Mr. Machine gun, uh, shoot up everybody in the goddamn place. Will you tell us about your last killing? Well, it was a young girl under a bridge. She came in carrying a loaf of bread, and I just cut her throat from ear to ear. What for? Well, I wanted the loaf of bread, of course. And what do you think to be your most uh, famous killing in your life? Well, the time I killed the uh, eight men on the Bowery the sidewalk, there, they were just standing there laughing around. I didn't like their faces, so I just shot them all with a machine gun. It, it was very, very uh, famous. It, all the newspapers carried the story. Thank you very much. And uh, whom do you prefer kill? Uh, well, it's all the same to me. I don't know. They're going to execute me tomorrow anyway. So. Well, you know, he's a very famous kill. I suppose he will deserve his uh, electric trial. Yeah. Well, uh, they're coming to get me now. I have to go. So long. Here we are on the death cell. <laughs> well, they're we strapping are... him in. <laughs> they're putting him on the chair now. 
the officer is approaching the stand, he's raising his arm, uh, he's taking the, the, switch. the switch. Now? It's the last word. <laughs> well, <laughs> what is your last word? Well, uh, well, uh, don't pull the switch! <laughs> a good sense of humor, you know, uh, but uh, when they remove that execution part and say we are laughing at the end of the first part, it's distortion that goes with Oswald throughout this post-assassination time. <laughs> well, uh, please, next one. Don't be heavier. Well, that's Marina. At that time, that's the place where Lee met uh, Marina. Uh, I would say, for the sake of clarity, in literature, uh, Macmill Macmillan says, writes that she, Marina, didn't know he was an American. She believed him to be Lithuanian or something. That's wrong. She knew from the very beginning he was American. And this uh, Lithuanian business, uh, sometimes, uh, well, Lee, at that time, rather would not reveal his American identity. He was bored with sort of uh, misunderstanding. You know, there's political implications and everything. And she rather wanted to mix with uh, the crowd. And being Lithuanian is, uh, was quite tolerable, was part of the Soviet Union. And uh, we agreed that whenever we meet a girl who would pay attention to this, his accent, Russian, in Russian accent, uh, he would say that he is Lithuanian. But at that time, Marina exactly knew he was American. Well, just to give an idea how he spoke Russian, he did speak Russian. Now, so, something like this, I speak Russian very well. I can read Russian newspapers and... Uh, well, that sort of, I suppose you're a Russian audience. You, well, that's with accent, but it's quite adequate, quite okay, especially when it went to household things, uh, say at work, uh, newspapers, uh, shopping, uh, that uh, sort of thing. Uh, come on, please. Well, that's happy marine uh, family, new family. Lee and Maureen on the balcony of the house. Well, another one with a baby. They're already in Moscow. Uh, here, there in, at his place. Uh, please, next one. Will you? Well, on parting, Lee uh, left with me his books. Uh, he just handed me the English language book. And then on second thought, he just uh, just cut off the uh, inscription, uh, the small handwriting on the pages here. So it's sort of mutilating. Oh, there was another grand gesture. He would wear a heavy ring. The envy of all the workers at the factory, they suggested him to swap it for something else. He never did that. And there on the parting, we just took off this ring and gave it to me. And I thought it was a valuable thing. And I said, no, Lee, possibly you'll need money. Well, that's <laughs> and what do we have next? Uh-huh. That's uh, the address, my address, I wrote down in his book. That's, uh, he gave me the number, American Embassy telephone number, said, just in case. And next one, please. And here, my last letter to him, I asked him, him to bring with him uh, research books. Uh, the matter is that he wrote me a letter that they're coming back to the Soviet Union. It, and actually, they applied for return. And Marina would write that uh, she's here uh, only in the United States. She understood how uh, stupid was her rash act of going to the United States. She doesn't know the language, that sort of thing. And Oswald uh, wrote, uh, please uh, issue visa for Marina. If anything, uh, I'll follow next. So by that time, uh, they were busy with uh, visa uh, applications. And the last they got from the embassy, wait, your 
application is being processed. But uh, you know what happened next. And uh, next, please. Well, that's Lee. Well, you know, somehow researchers don't pay attention to one thing, that he was very much politically minded. He claims that he came as a researcher to the Soviet Union uh, to know what, how that system worked in practice, and really he was a researcher. We had debates on different political systems, which better and we arrived to socialist and cap socialism and capitalism. Uh, I was stubborn with my, well, uh, political upbringing, brainwashing and everything at that time. I insisted that Soviet, uh, socialist, socialist system was the only correct one. I would indicate on race, race discrimination that, uh, well, Black people would be raised, uh, well, uh, hanged, lynched there. He said, well, yes, there are some wrongs in our society. By the way, whenever it came to a debate, uh, and there would be present American side and Soviet side, Russian side, he would, uh, would, uh, would take the American side in many cases. So he insisted uh, that uh, I was sort of too stubborn. He said, you've never been abroad. You live here like slaves, his word. You can't travel abroad. It was quite an argument. I admitted that he was right, although at that time I thought, so what? I can't, our country is huge. I can travel everywhere. Indeed, I travel along our country. And again, when it came to, well, we played mock, uh, stage mock uh, combat fights. He taught me how it was in the, in, uh, in the Navy. Uh, na would teach me the drill exercises. And during those fights, you see, I observed that he was not non-violent. You see, whenever I know, well, uh, men here, when you, uh, certainly sometimes I would come to a sort of combat, different level and mo motion level, you immediately realize your opponent whether he is really evil or not. Uh, as far as Oswald was concerned, I couldn't feel, I didn't feel that evil in him. He was very careful not to hurt, uh, that sort of. And again, when well would develop situation when that would take to a fight at work, he would just stand quietly looking at his opponent. And that was quite down his opponent. They wouldn't fight after that. And here, he was really interested in social political aspects of life. We discussed that with him. We discussed philosophy with him. He wasn't philosophically educated. But when I would, you see, I had philosophy uh, course at the medical institute, and when I would start on academic level, he would be out of his depth. But when we come uh, down to, uh, well, say, calling spade a spade, he would immediately grasp the, grasp the idea. Uh, particularly, we discussed sense perception aspect of philosophy, uh, the central to idealism and materialism. And uh, he was quite bright to get the essence when I wasn't too uh, high floating as far as my language was. And uh, please, next slide, please. Well, okay. Uh, here I give, well, when he, uh, already in America, United States, he uh, wrote, uh, well, an essay, a life of uh, workers in, United, in the Soviet Union. Well, he, there I found details that I didn't know about my own country. He was so observant. Uh, then he mocked those numerous political uh, meetings, uh, indoctrinations that would on a regular basis uh, stay, uh, to take place at the factory. Those rehearsed demonstrations, he would rather sleep over them on May Day and October Revolution. 
he was surprised uh, in planned economy, there were slogans, uh, we must fulfill our, uh, well, five-year plan in three years. Uh, from his American point of view, it was absurd what to do with the soup, well, of production. It was uh, absolutely, uh, well, uh, out of his understanding what kind of planned philosophy uh, economy it is if it is just uh, not kept adhered to. Uh, here, uh, unfortunately, you can't see them. Uh, he is for, he, for his essays, well, first, he developed his Athenian system when he combined the best features of capitalism and uh, socialism, like uh, on American soil, uh, free market economy, free education, uh, uh, free medical care, uh, many very useful and interesting things. Uh, well, no sales, uh, sales only small arms, you see, even that time. In literature, he is viewed uh, as an idealist. And indeed he was. And his idea was to create his party who would follow his, develop his credo and organize masses, masses, uh, well, under this theory. And he expected that uh, at that time, uh, menace of atomic war, nuclear war, was very much around. And he viewed that as a catastrophe after which people both in capitalist countries and socialist countries wouldn't like to live the way they lived before. They knew the result. And then he believed that his uh, new theory would unite people and make them happy. They will build a new society along his doctrine. And he was very serious about that. One of his uh, well, uh, postulates there was we must not uh, forcefully uh, f well, uh, fight, against, uh, uh, fight against the government. By the way, he admired Kennedy, uh, youthful, energetic, clever president. You know. And to him, to kill a president would be to kill his own theory, nonviolence. Uh, he wrote, nothing can be substituted for uh, constant work, persuasion, all the other thing. Uh, somehow, this side of his activity is uh, somewhere in the shade, although it explains why he came to the Soviet Union, uh, why he, uh, well, uh, very many things. Uh, you see, uh, for the lack of time, I can't go into all that, but I gave... Uh, uh, go into much detail in my book that's on sale there. Uh, and uh, the next one is, well, that's uh, Norman Mailer, myself, uh, discussing things in my laboratory. Uh, and the next one, oh, that's the book. And just uh, small things. I'm about to completely all tired. Well, just a few remarks. The first speaker said that Marina was uh, niece of a KGB officer. That is wrong. He was only a um, uh, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs, militia. Nothing to do with KGB, uh, at, at least on the surface of it. Uh, then, uh, then, 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 uh -huh. well, Well, thank you. And anyway, you're done. <laughs> Our final keynote speaker tonight, Anthony Summers, is coming into us from England. It's pretty early in the morning there, and he was kind enough to stay up. Uh, he's the author of a well-known book on the case, uh, just reissued, called Not in Your Lifetime, with new information in it. And uh, 
He has eight best-selling nonfiction books and a book, recent book on September 11th, The Tax Called the 11th Day, The Full Story of 9-11, and Osama bin Laden, which was a finalist for the 2012 Pulitzer Prize for history. And uh, he's the only author to have twice been awarded the UK's gold dagger for nonfiction on crime issues uh, for this 11th day 